Hey there, I'm Josiah Marabella, and I'm here to talk about this guy, and be grateful for it. Alright, let's get started. Hernando de Soto of Spain. This guy was awesome. And though he has an interesting history in Peru, I'm going to talk about his explorations in America. Bear in mind, Hernando's trail through North America isn't known for certain due to information lost over time, so some of what I'm going to tell you might be a complete lie. Disclaimer over. Alright, now that that's settled, where was I? Yes, de Soto. Hernando was born October 27, 1498, in Extremadura. He later left and sailed to the New World with the first governor of Panama around age 20. After participating in Gaspar de Espinosa's expedition to Virgua and Francesco Hernandez de Cordoba's conquest of the Yucatan Peninsula, Hernando proved his bravery and loyalty and got to lead a conquest of Peru. May 1539. Hernando and his 620 men pile out of nine ships with some 220 horses in what we know as South Tampa Bay. Among them are priests, craftsmen, engineers, farmers, and merchants. Most come from Europe, some from Cuba, but they're all searching for one thing. Well, actually three things. Gold, silver, and a passage to China. Earlier that year, Hernando had petitioned King Charles for governorship of Guatemala so he could explore the New World but he got governorship of Cuba instead and was told, go do your colonizing thing. As they unloaded their supplies, they found a man named Juan Ortiz, a Spaniard who had been living with the Mocoso, a local chiefdom, after escaping near death by the hands of the Uzita, another local chiefdom. Juan had lived in America for a while and over time learned the Timucu language, so Hernando said something along the lines of, hey dude, want to come with us? Having someone who could speak the native language would be great. And Juan said something like, yeah, okay. Juan quickly proved his use recruiting guides from different tribes as they passed, creating a system that allowed them to know where they were at all times. 1540. Hernando and his men just made it out of what we call Florida and began trekking through what is now Georgia in search of gold. But as the expedition continued into modern-day South Carolina, they found no gold. After trekking some more, Hernando reached the Appalachian Mountains in North Carolina and then entered Tennessee where he followed the Tennessee River to Alabama. After reaching the Cusa chiefdom, Hernando rested there for a month before turning south to meet two ships with fresh supplies in the Gulf of Mexico. On his way to Mexico, Hernando traveled through the territory of Chief Tuscaloosa. Tuscaloosa told them that he would supply them Mavila. Or Mavila. Never mind. Mavila was a fortified city in southern Alabama that was surrounded by a strong wooden palisade with bastions lining it for longbowmen. But after they reached the village, Tuscaloosa simply told them, Go away and withdrew into the fortress. Determined to make it into the town, Hernando attacked. The Indians fought vigorously, keeping the Spaniards out of the town for so long that men, tired and thirsty, went to drink at a nearby pond tinged with blood. But once they broke the palisade and made it into the stronghold, Hernando ordered his men to set fire to the buildings. The rest was a slaughter, as Indians fled the town and Spaniards cut down the ones who remained. The battle lasted for nine hours, and in those nine hours, 200 Spaniards died, and 150 were badly wounded. But the Mobilian losses were far greater. An estimated 4,000 Mobilian warriors died in those nine hours, making it one of the bloodiest battles ever recorded in North American history. Even though the Spaniards won, they had lost most of their possessions and nearly one-fourth of their horses. They were wounded and sickened in an unknown area with limited equipment surrounded by potential enemies. Fearing that Spain would hear of their stay and cancel the expedition, Hernando led his men away from the Gulf of Mexico and into Mississippi. Spring, 1541. Hernando just demanded that the Chickasaw hand over 200 of their men as slaves, and being a logical tribe, they said, no. Later that night, the Chickasaw attacked the Spanish camp, killing 40 men and destroying the remainder of their equipment. The expedition could have been wiped out then and there, but the Chickasaw let them go. Hernando and his remaining 400 men trekked straight into the Mississippi River. This was not good for Hernando. He had to take 400 men across a broad river that was patrolled constantly by hostile tribes. But that didn't stop him. In about one month, Hernando had constructed several floats to ferry his troops across the river and made it to what the natives called the Valley of Vapors, or more modernly known as Hot Springs, Arkansas. Since the tribes made an agreement to be at peace in the Thermal Springs and put down their weapons, Hernando stayed just long enough to mark the land as Spain's. After a very cold winter, their interpreter Juan Ortiz died. With him gone, the expedition got exceptionally harder. They didn't go much further. 
After reaching the Caddo River and clashing with the Tula, the expedition turned around and returned to the Mississippi. May 21st, 1542. Hernando de Soto died of a fever in the native village of Guachoya. Before his death, he set Luis de Mocoso Alvarado as the new leader of the expedition. He died with four Indian slaves, three horses, and 700 hogs. Since Hernando had convinced the natives that he was an immortal sun god, his men hid his death by wrapping him in blankets and weighing them down with sand, so that Hernando de Soto would sink to the bottom of the Mississippi River, never coming out again. Well, that concludes my presentation on Hernando de Soto, but if you're at all interested in what happens to Luis de Mocosos Alvarado, or you want to learn about Hernando de Soto in more depth, then go look it up. I've barely scratched the tip of this iceberg. There are tons of cool facts just waiting to be discovered. Thanks for watching, I'll see you later.